5051 Heavy, can you see the airport off your right? Yep, we got it inside now, United 2851 Heavy. United 2851 Heavy, you're cleared visual approach 24 right. Clear for the visual 24 right, United 2851 Heavy. Spears 327, turn 20 degrees right, intercept the 109.9 localized, so that's 25 right. Boom. All right, I'm here, and my hair looks just as bad as it did last week. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I know, right? Um, okay, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. We got a lot of um, material to cover. Um, and uh, hopefully all of you got a chance to read the ADM thing. So we'll start going over that. I think with that, I'm going to talk about some accidents that have occurred and then how we can take ADM and kind of apply it to those. So we'll actually have a little discussion about what we read in the book, look at those accidents, and then say, okay, what, you know, what techniques could we use in ADM to sort of um, you know, mitigate the problems that occurred there, or what, they didn't even have it in a lot of, time, a lot of cases back then, they weren't even thinking about this kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's pretty, uh, we'll try to make it as interesting as I can, so. <laughs> uh, let's see, are we going forward? Let's see here. Cool, that is working, all right. Yeah, so the reading was uh, two, three. I didn't mention four because I want to introduce four uh, today. Um, and that's basic aerodynamics. I didn't want you to read that chapter before I started talking about it because the way the FAA explains it is kind of different than I'd like to explain it for this class. So um, I'm going to talk about it, but when you go back to read it, it's a lighter chapter too. So um, you'll have a little more insight based on what we talk about today for that one. But yeah, the topics uh, then are aeronautical decision making, uh, taking techniques and making good decisions before flying. Uh, aircraft construction, just go over the basic parts. I know most of us know what a fuselage is, but we're gonna talk about it anyhow. <laughs> and, uh, then, uh, the, and then we're talking about air, basic aerodynamics. I figure the break will be somewhere right around the middle of aircraft construction at uh, an hour and 15. So hopefully everything is streaming out. If you're out there and you don't see a stream, you're not gonna hear me ask you if there's a stream, but uh, hello, welcome. Um, so yeah, so hopefully streaming's all good. Uh, and it looks like it is, it says that I'm live. So um, if you, one of you guys in the room have your phone and just pull up the link and just make sure that the stream is coming through, that would be, through. it is awesome, great. All right, I like it. All right, great, 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 awesome. All right, so let's go, let's go into ADM. Um, so aeronautical decision making, I talked a little bit just now about it, is the process of evaluating the risks before a flight, looking at all the elements that could affect the successful outcome of a, of a flight. So the FAA thinks this is super, super important because, um, well, it is. They found that people who do spend time looking at all of the aspects of their flight before they go, have a, 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 they'll, they'll understand what the risks, the potential risks are involved. So it's um, a huge reference in the FAA manual. And I think I mentioned it wasn't even something that was around 30 years ago. They just started sort of putting this in as part of the material for, for flight training. Um, so it is surprising, like when I first got back into flying, I didn't have any of this training. When I was in my original ground school, it was like, hey, we just, let's learn about flying. So this ended up being something they found was hugely valuable to help prevent accidents. Um, the written actually only has a handful of questions on this. So I know we're spending time on it. it it's important though when you go into training to know this because it'll be presented in flight training too. They'll talk about these these things as well. Um, yeah, flight instructors are really told to emphasize this. Um, and then when you go to take a practical test even, they'll be telling, they'll be asking you to come up with a PAVE list and we'll talk about PAVE and all that later. So um, yeah, so I said earlier, we'll talk about some accidents and then figure out how we can apply this practically to accidents. Um, you know, let's see here. Yeah, I think I've covered all those points that I wanted to, so let's go ahead. So, um, do you know the Wright brothers actually flew almost 900 flights without an accident, without a fatality, that is. <laughs> and that's pretty incredible when you think they did their first flight in 1903 and the first fatality recorded in aviation history was in 1908. So they had a lot of flying under their belt. 
And that fatality was a result of a propeller that uh, basically came apart and then hit the right flyer and uh, damaged some of the control surfaces. And as a consequence, the plane nosedive. Orville was hurt pretty bad, and Thomas Selfridge was the fatality in that. He was, a, um, I believe, a lieutenant. And Marcy's going to pass right behind me, um, a lieutenant in um, the military. And, and the Wright brothers were selling, they were selling their planes to the military at that time. And uh, he had flown quite a bit um, that day. And he'd been fl flying quite a bit, and he was pretty exhausted. They had been touring everywhere. So that's an important element when you look at ADM, and we'll talk about that one later. Um, uh, if you guys are familiar with the day the music died, that was when uh, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper crashed in 1959 in Iowa. We'll go over that accident. And that was in a Bonanza, which is a, a low-wing four-seater single-engine plane. Um, we'll also talk about uh, Jim Croce. This is a, an interesting one. The pilot ran three miles to the airport, had a coronary disease, um, but still managed to take off. But he, tripped, he, he clipped a tree at the end of the runway. Um, and then uh, everyone on the plane died uh, at that point. <laughs> that, was a, that was a surprising one. Um, January 1999, that's the John Denver accident in Monterey. He, was, he had an experimental uh, called a Long Easy. And it's kind of a weird looking plane. I have a pictures of it. But he's, his fuel selector was over the shoulder. He actually starved one of the tanks. And in the process of trying to reach for the fuel selector, he pressed on the other rudder pedal and then caused the plane to dive and crash. Then uh, the other one we'll look at is uh, JFK Jr. This is basically a pilot who was under experience for the conditions he was flying in. And over flying from Arthur's Vineyard, he got disoriented in the aircraft, lots of climbing and descending, and then eventually lost, con lost control or lost his sense about his situational awareness and crashed that plane. Um, everyone, again, on that one died. And then the, the last one I'm going to look at is uh, really, it's a ground-based incident, but um, an operator was running a skydiving outfit. And they normally operated single-engine planes, but this one time they were operating in twins. He decided that he wasn't going to shut down the engines on the ramp while he was waiting for the next um, skydiver group to come in. But he called into the office and asked the FBO operator if he could have a sandwich for lunch. Well, they've been used to single engines, and that, uh, that operator came out to the ramp to bring him a sandwich and ran right into the propeller, killed her immediately. So. You know, there's a, there's a thing where somebody decided that he wasn't going to shut the engines off because, you know, I, I didn't think anything would happen. But, you know, there's cases where, you know, things are normal and going normal and something like that can happen. It's really bad. So, um, so the first thing we'll talk about is this uh, idea of PAVE. And it's really just a technique to look at the elements of a flight and then assess different aspects of it. So. There's the pilot aspect, there's the aircraft aspect, there's the environment, and then there's external pressures. Uh, so when you look at the pilot aspect, it's your, you're basically looking at you. Like, what have you, what, if, what kind of stress are you under? What's your health like? Have you eaten? Have you slept? Uh, those are kind of like the big things. So uh, they have an acronym. There's lots of acronyms in that ADM chapter. <laughs> There's no, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, there's no lack of acronyms in the ADM chapter. We'll put it that way. Uh, so uh, when we look at PAVE, I got, I do have it on the slide here. Um, yeah, so I'm safe is the big acronym. That's the one at least I remember the best, and it and it's an easy one to think about. Um, you you have got illness. Are you sick? Are you healthy enough to fly? Um, medication, obviously. Are you taking something that make you drowsy or, or make you hyper? Or did you miss taking medication that you do need to take? Um, there's also alcohol. You know, you can't fly a plane. It's eight hours bottle of throttle. So if you've had anything to drink, um, you know, you got to take that into consideration. And even after eight hours, you know, how do you really feel? If you're hungover, it may not be the best time to go fly. Uh, if you haven't eaten, if you haven't eaten for the day, that can also affect you mentally. Um, and obviously, any external stress, a family member that's ill, um, you know, something didn't go right at work. Um, you could, it could even be something that's good happening, like somebody in the family had a, had a baby, and you're just thinking about that or a wedding that's coming up. 
Um, there's a case where um, at least an external, well, this is an external pressure at the bottom too, but some of the things that, about that are like mission-based. So like you have a, a birthday party you really want to get to and it'll force you to, to make a decision to go fly when you probably shouldn't. So the external pressures and then your own, you know, health and safety and stress, you know, are, are factors here. The aircraft, now this comes down to looking at the equipment. Do you, how well do you know the equipment in the airplane? Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with uh, the operation of the aircraft? Do you have enough time, recent time, in that airplane to, to have a successful flight? Do you know the capabilities of the aircraft? Does it, um, you know, will it get, will it fly the distance you want to go? Can it land uh, or take off at the airports that you're going to with the current weather conditions? Um, are you legal to fly that plane under certain circumstances? Experimental planes have restrictions, but even in the case of um, the, the flight with uh, Coe Bryant, that operator wasn't really supposed to fly in instrument conditions. That plane wasn't certified for that. So um, I think he was trying to avoid you know, being in, in the instrument conditions because of that. Um, the environment is simply you know, the weather that's going on, the types of, uh, you know, the types of mountains or terrain, if you're going over water, are you equipped to go over water? Again, there's certain requirements in the uh, FAA regulations that you have to have flotation devices. And, you know, um, in some cases, if you're going really far over water, you need to actually have a raft in the aircraft. So you need to look at that. Yeah. Um, the uh, other thing is, let's see, you know, knowing where you're going and getting around, yeah. Um, so going to an airport, you're probably going to go to an FBO, go to a restaurant. An FBO is just an operator that runs out of the airport that has services like a terminal would have. So they'll have refueling services and showers and um, lounges and snacks and food. Um, so knowing where that is when you land, it's not going to be the same place as a terminal. So understanding, you know, being prepared for that environment when you get there. Also, just how long the runways are or how short the runways are and what condition the runways are in. Um, we took a flight to Death Valley and the runways were full of gravel. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's <clears throat> something we weren't expecting, but stones were getting thrown all over the aircraft. And, and that was, uh, you know, it's concerning because if you get a chip in your propeller, it could actually cause a crack in your propeller, and that's super bad. So even knowing the conditions of the airport is a good thing, just to take your time and, and, and be patient when you're going over those surfaces when they have those kind of conditions. Um, again, <clears throat> I briefly touched on external pressures, but this is, a, this is like the case where you're in a hurry to get somewhere. Um, so you're, you don't want, or you don't want to disapp disappoint a uh, client or somebody, or you have friends you're going to see have a birthday party. And this happened uh, a few years ago. Somebody was flying uh, out of San Jose area in a Saratoga and with his family and he was trying to get to Las Vegas for a birthday party and didn't want to disappoint them. So he was not instrument rated. He ended up over Bakersfield with uh, instrument conditions. And then he actually accepted an instrument clearance when he wasn't rated. And he got disoriented, similar to what happened with JFK Jr. And uh, everyone perished on that, on that flight, too. So, you know, PAVE, PAVE and ADM is a very serious thing, because if you use these tools, just think about, you know, where you are and, and where the aircraft is. Are you, are you ready to handle it? The uh, type of environment that you're going to be taking the plane to and then the conditions there. Um, and then don't feel pressured outside, you're the pilot in command, you're the one that's in charge of, of the success of the mission. Um, the other thing that the book talks about, and you see this a lot also in the test material, is these hazardous attitudes. And I originally thought they were kind of humorous <laughs> because uh, you see this, you see these attitudes every day in people, They're, um, in, in other areas, right? Anti-authority and impulsivity and, and invulnerability macho and, and resignation and then you kind of think about yourself you know when you're reading this you're like well that's that's other people that's not me but um you know you you can fall prey to these too um so anti-authority 
uh, a lot of times it's easy to look at a regulation or a rule and say, well, that's, that's for, that doesn't apply to me here in this situation. Um, and if you don't really understand you know, the basis for these rules, that you might say that. Um, in a lot of cases, this is a good reason why they're there. Um, and the antidote for this hazardous attitude is just follow the rules. So a lot of times you get frustrated, you know, you want to get somewhere or something and the ATC will tell you, I need you to, I need you to circle here or stay here or, you know, stay behind this area. Or even if you're on the runway walking around and there's an area where you can't walk into and let's say you lose something like, you know, a um, piece of paper or something that's got something important on it. Well, you just can't go run out onto the runway and grab it. Um, you know, the rules are there for a reason. You have to go through the process. Um, probably impulsivity is the biggest one I fall prey to. And that's just, um, you know, you think you mechanically know how to do something, so you're pushing buttons. This is the, the great example is the, the pushing buttons before you see what the button does sort of attitude, you know? Um, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I want this menu, and then you push it, and then you see, well, that's not the menu I wanted, but if I had just set, you know, spent a little bit of time thinking about it first, I would have hit the right button in the first place. I mean, that's a really simple case of it. Uh, but impulsivity, you know, if you have bad in situational awareness, which we'll also talk about, you're not really un understanding what's going on around you, you may make an impulsive decision because you're convinced that it's, it's safe to make that decision without really looking at um, what you're about to do. So that's, it's really important that you don't, you just take your time and be patient in those cases. Um, I think this invulnerability is, I think that operator that had that plane didn't shut off his engine and was a little bit like, well, you know, that kind of stuff doesn't happen here. He had probably no idea that leaving the engines on would end up like that. So, um, and, and these are pilots with tons of hours, right? So, you know, allowing, <clears throat> allowing yourself to think that nothing's gonna happen or these things don't, these, these things don't apply to you is pretty dangerous. Uh, the macho attitude is uh, an interesting one too. <laughs> That's, that could be the case where, let's say, you're flying into an airport and you and another person are coming in at the same time and you decide that, well, I'm gonna gun my plane and try to get ahead of this guy. You know, I'm gonna try to race him and I can beat him. Um, you know, and maybe doing so entering the pattern in an in a, in improper way. Um, you know, and this can end up in things like airplanes colliding over the airport because people are trying to, you know, outgun somebody else. Um, also like just trying to squeak by something like, oh, I can get by this. Uh, it's almost kind of impulsivity, you know, in the sense that you're not taking your time, but, um, you know, just thinking about <clears throat> what you're doing, is it risky? I mean, basically was what that comes down to. Um, resignation, this is basically feeling like you can't do anything and, and this is bad luck syndrome. It's like, well, you know, I, it's, this is just how it's going and I, I can't get out of it. I, Trying to think of a good example of this would be <clears throat> uh, a pilot one time was uh, flying a regular route to New York City and he was trying to shoot a bunch of approaches in bad weather and he kept missing them. And ATC is like, well, you can ask, you know, you can declare an emergency, you know. And he's like, well, I don't want to bother you guys or anything like, <laughs> you know, like that. And, and he eventually did declare an emergency, but he had like two gallons of fuel left, so he wasn't able to make the, he, he had an opportunity to land at a military air base, and you can do that in an emergency, but you have to ask, you have to ask for, you have to declare an emergency. ATC can't do it for you. So in some way, he was sort of resigned to the fact that he wasn't gonna get any help and he wasn't gonna get out of this, so. That could be a bad example. That's the only thing I could think of in resignation. But, um, but the idea here is, at least in the written test, is there's an antidote <clears throat> that they want you to recognize. So if you do see these behaviors in yourself, um, this is what you have to correct that, that attitude with. Um, this is another point that's also in the, in the written, is that human error. A pilot involved in an accident usually knows what went wrong. 
and uh, the hazards from that decision. So that ramp fatality is a perfect example of, you know, he knew he should have shut the engines off and he didn't. Um, there were a lot of other acronyms <laughs> in there. Um, I can tell you though, from my experience, PAVE and the hazardous attitudes are the ones that come up the most often, but you will see the five Ps, the plane, the plan, the plane, the pilot, the passengers and the programming. Um, I think different phases of the flight, you can evaluate those five items and determine the actions that are needed to help you stay on track. Um, the three Ps is uh, just something to think about as you're um, choosing, choosing the next, choosing an action. That's also like the decide model was another one, which is to detect, estimate, identify solutions, uh, do, which is execute a solution, then evaluate the effects of that. So like if the plane is, if, if there's an engine failure, for example, um, you'll detect it because you'll see you don't have power. Um, then you determine if you should respond. Yeah, I should. <laughs> then you have to choose, um, choose the solution. So, the, you know, in an engine out procedure, you want to get the plane flying first of all, and then start troubleshooting it. Um, and then evaluate the effects. So if your troubleshooting went successfully, then, you know, hey, plane started up again. I just had the fuel selector on the empty tank. So, um, but that's, those ones I haven't seen as much. They're in that book. Um, I just kind of chose to focus mostly on the, the PAVE and the hazardous attitudes there. Um, yeah, single pilot resource management. So like I mentioned, your pilot in command, uh, the regulations say this, 91.3 uh, in the regulations. So at any point in the flight, if you don't like something, um, you have every right to declare an emergency or, tell a or decline ATC something um, and tell them, no, it's not safe to do that. Um, and you're responsible for the successful execution of the mission, not you know, the people sitting next to you in the plane, unless you appoint them pilot in command. Um, part of being responsible for that flight is having good situational awareness, which is, you know, understanding the total overview of what's going on and not being fixated on a particular thing. So that could have, like an insider outside the plane, oh, look, there's Osprey flying outside the plane. And then you're looking at the Osprey and not flying the plane. And all of a sudden you turn like 20 degrees and you didn't realize it. And then you go on for 30 miles off course or something like that. Yeah, Carson. So in this case, the ATC isn't always 100% correct. The, Carson said in, in some cases, the ATC is not 100% correct. And that's true. Um, they, they're doing the best they can and they're human as well. They can make mistakes. They can fly you into restricted airspace. Um, and a lot of times you just want to ask them, like, hey, did you mean to do this? Or are you talking, are you talking to me? You know, you might get an instructor to fly downwind on a leg and you're on the final approach phase into the airport. And they said, uh, continue, continue down, left downwind. And we're like, y you already cleared me to land, you know? <laughs> and, and that can happen. So you, you definitely need to just let, help them out. They're helping you and, and you can help them out just by saying, oh, were you talking to me? Cause I'm on final. No, no, he'll say something like, no, it's not gonna, Five two Yankee Yankee or something. So, I haven't heard any Yankee Yankees though. So, good tail number. Um, <laughs> so workload management is <laughs> workload management is uh, you know part of good situational awareness. Having uh, having your plan in front of you and then um, <clears throat> you know the materials for that for that route. Like your charts are set up. You have a nav log of some kind, whether that's electronically. Um, at any point in the flight, you know what the next thing is to come. My instructor always used to tell me what's next. You know, you, you think you can just sit around and listen to music because you're in cruise, but you know, ahead of you is going to be coming into this airport, landing. You know, the approach phase. Um, you know, and just checking, doing as much as you can for yourself ahead of time will really help you improve your situational awareness. Um, priors, prioritizing those activities too. Um, when you're coming in to an airport terminal area that's towered with a lot of traffic, um, there's a lot going on. You have to fly the plane, you have to take instructions from ATC, you have to acknowledge those instructions. Um, 
you know, you'll have to stay clear of other aircraft. You'll also have to just listen to what other people are doing. So using all the available resources you have to you at that time, whether it's the flight computer, the auto autopilot, if you have an autopilot in the plane, um, even if it's a passenger that you trust, you can say, hey, can you look out for traffic or do you see that plane? Just keep an eye on him. Don't be afraid to ask. Yeah, right. <laughs> Don't be afraid to ask for help, whatever case it might be. And then also talking to ATC and saying, I, you know, I don't like the way things are going. I want, I need to circle here. I've been, you know, I've been sent on a descent to an airport at, at a faster rate than I wanted to do. And I just tell the controller, hey, um, I, need, I need another minute here. Can I just do a 360 so I can get my, my stuff together? I can lose altitude because I'm coming down too steep. So yeah, recognizing task saturation. So that'd be a case where, yeah, I, I could probably have descended the plane super, super fast. Um, but that felt uncomfortable to me. So, and in most cases, you'll just say, hey, I need to, I need to loop here, uh, do a 360 to lose some more altitude. And yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, so again, the resources, uh, just being, I, I mean, part of, the, part of the ground school is knowing what's available to you to use um, as far as planning, right? And the more information, the more things you know of and you think about as far as uh, executing a su successful flight, um, and it will just help you do that much better on that flight. And I mean, it's like I said, it, online in flight weather, you can ask for weather from ATC. Obviously, the handbooks and, and checklists are huge benefits. So, you get in a situation where you might feel a little task saturated, just pull that checklist out and follow, you know, follow through the checklist so you don't miss something. Because anytime you're hurried, you can, you can skip something. Um, the autopilot, you know, a lot of planes, even training planes now have autopilots in them. Super handy if you're getting task saturated and you need to sort of reset yourself. Um, there's a lot of free uh, uh, information available too. So all the charts and the references that we'll talk about later, are, a lot of those are free. And there's, Jefferson also has um, their own publications which are a little more advanced and have some other utility information in, in the same charts that the FAA publishes. So, but yeah, these summaries, it's like they want you to succeed. Here's all this information. Here it is, it's free, you know. Um, so that's kind of, uh, that's another topic you'll see come up. So that, that this chart is in the book. I don't know if you guys remember seeing this one, but essentially it's looking at, you know, Plan trip, what are your capabilities and what's your margin of safety? So you see the little red hump there that's indicating that the current flight activity has exceeded your capabilities and that means there could be huge risk at that point. So that's all this, this chart's demonstrating, but it kind of gives you a visual idea of what does it mean to be task saturated and, and what does it mean to look at your own personal capabilities and the, and the flight that, that you're gonna take. So the FAA as uh, part of like this PAVE stuff and everything has come out with these w risk worksheets. And <clears throat> a lot of airlines even use them. They evaluate the flight that they're gonna take, the conditions, the weather, the, stat the health of the pilots. They look at all the elements surrounding PAVE and then they attribute points. So in the, in the text, there's an example of one of these risk assessment sheets. So I had a, um, an instructor who flew uh, privately for a corporation, but even they had it too. So they would sit down before a flight and go through the sheet. If the points didn't work out the right way, they might cancel the flight, they might not take it. So it's a really good way. It also helps you stay focused and be honest. I mean, you have to be honest with yourself when you look at any kind of worksheet like this. Um, and it really will help you validate if you have a good go or no go decision. Um, and I always say it's not only you, but it's your passengers that you have to think about in this case. Um, I can't imagine if the Kobe Bryant incident had gone through a paved worksheet if he might have not flown that day, you know, for example. So, um, yeah. So personal minimums is another aspect to this, which is um, looking at your flight experience. Are you comfortable flying at night? Are you comfortable flying in this plane? Um, and there are worksheets that can actually, um, you, you fill this information out as you stay current, and then it can help you decide whether or not you think, uh, um, as far as the pilot and PAVE, 
if you're ready to take on that mission. So those are other ways we can um, keep ourselves in check. So this is kind of like one of these risk assessment sheets looks like. And then depending on the number of points you get, I can do like a little pointer thing here. Try this. Um, does this show up? Yes, okay. Yeah, so depending on how your points come out, you'll end up somewhere on this thing here and uh, basically increasing risk. So, you know, you can look at this and say, okay, well, my points ended up here. You know, am I, okay, am I okay with that? You know, obviously if your points end up somewhere over there, you'd be like, yeah, I'm not gonna, probably not gonna go. Um, but they have different categories. I don't know if it's easy to see these on here and I can barely see them, but you know, these, this sheet has like sleep, how, how are you feeling? Um, what's the weather like? Are you prepared to fly into that weather? Um, stress, you know, is the flight a day or night time? And then you say, well, I'm not really comfortable flying at night, so I'd attribute more points to tonight. Um, and then planning is another area. So there's a bunch of different companies have sheets like this. There's ones free online that you can fill out actually online to do that. Um, so the, page two seven. the this one is on page two dash seven. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, do we have time? What time is it? It's half an hour. Yeah. I think we can do this. So <clears throat> I said earlier we'd look at the accidents and see how we can apply this aeronautical decision making to these accidents. And I touched lightly on it. So um, we have time to do this. So, so this is the aircraft that um, the, the uh, Buddy Holly and uh, the Big Bopper Richie Valens were in when they crashed. And this, was, uh, this happened um, actually during the departure phase. It wasn't very close to the airport. It was like five miles out. And when I went back and read on this one in detail, it turned out that this guy had a ton of hours, this pilot, and very experienced in a bonanza. And the conditions that night were pretty clear, but it was becoming uh, instrument weather. In other words, clouds were and fog and haze was uh, restricting visibility. Um, but the band had been traveling around on buses um, a lot in cold buses because it was uh, during winter in the Midwest. and. They were like, well, it'd be great if we just fly to the next gig. So they contracted this guy, and that, that flight <clears throat> took place in the winter. The, in, the, the pilot of this flight had been used to a certain type of attitude indicator of his instrumentation that he had been used to. And this aircraft had the newer version, which now isn't really new anymore, but it's the blue horizon with the brown you know, terrain. And it's kind of funny to think that that would be something that would trip somebody up with that many hours. But in fact, if you spent all your time flying IMC to that old instrument, um, and then all of a sudden find yourself on a plane and presented an IMC with this new instrument, um, it can be pretty tricky. And, and in, this kind of, in this case, I think that's part of what uh, tripped him up. So if you look at the last paragraph here, and I think it's legible, but it's uh, basically, it was caused by the pilot's decision to undertake a flight which the likelihood of encountering instrument conditions existed in the mistaken belief that he could cope with en route instrument weather um, without having the necessary familiar familiarization with the instruments. So if you look at PAVE, we could say that, well, this is probably, you know, part pilot, part aircraft, part environment, and part external pressures. So you can see all elements of PAVE um, presented in, a, in an accident like this. Um, it's pretty interesting. And this is long before the FAA and long before PAVE and ADM. Um, pretty interesting. Um, the Jim Croce incident, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, this pilot <clears throat> would, had ran three miles to the airport. And um, I think I'm gonna remove me from here, so you see the corner here. Um, yeah, look at the number of hours, 14,000 hours. And 20 
uh, 100 or 2200 hours in that aircraft, instrument rated. So <clears throat> really experienced pilot, right? Um, but they say, you know, he had uh, coronary, they didn't say if it was due to his heart condition, but you know, imagine he ran three miles. Um, he probably knew who he was flying, so he felt a lot of external pressures to get there, you know, on time and, and take that flight. Really interesting plane, pretty big. This one can hold like eight or so people, twin, um, a twin bonanza. So in this case, um, it, as soon as they got to the end of the runway, they clipped a tree. Um, and and it, this is a case of probably uh, environment, right? Not knowing the airport. So you look at an airport diagram. And again, I think this was at night, so you're obviously not gonna know the trees there unless you've done the planning ahead of time and looked at that airport diagram and saw that. Oh, there's a tree marked because the the publications will show like uh, obstacles around the airport, and that tree would a tree that big would obviously have the been on there. Yeah. Show it on there too. What's that? The they don't show trees because trees are kind of weird. They're not always there. <laughs> Sometimes they are, <laughs> but they will show them on the um, on the taxi diagrams. You'll see there'll be like a little there'll be like shrubs or trees or forest or something like that marked on it, yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, in this case, you know, these guys are working with paper charts. It's probably an airport. It may be an airport he flew out of often. I didn't, I didn't gather that. But certainly, you could say that um, an invulnerability in a hazardous attitude played a part Did here. Did determine whether he died before he crashed or was it as a result of the crash? Was it a heart attack or? Well, you would think, yeah. I that he died of a heart attack and crashed the plane, but that doesn't seem to be what you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's, they, I don't know if they were really clear on it, and I tried to find a better detailed description of the accident. But, you know, when you look at um, the, the po po probable cause on this case, it has failed to see and avoid objects or obstructions. It didn't really say anything about his heart condition. The mentions in the remarks section at the bottom, pilot had severe coronary artery disease ran from uh, the motel to the near, nearby airport. So that means, to me, he's not from the area, right? right. So he probably didn't know, um, he didn't know the, the, the airport layout. Um, he was taking off. Was it was, yeah, during takeoff and just clipped a tree. I mean, I could see that at night, and if you don't know the airport, and yeah, they probably were loaded up with band gear. The plane was probably heavy. They might have had a lot of fuel in it. And if you're a rocker, stay out of bonanza. <laughs> She's right. <laughs> yeah, this was um, September in Louisiana, so I bet it was pretty humid. So I bet uh, density, air density, might have had something to do with this. This as well. Um, plane probably just didn't climb as as quickly as he expected. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, this this thing is the long easy. I think this is actually is John Denver's long easy. I pulled uh, from the web. Um, and in this case, Denver, uh, he had a huge number of hours as well. I mean, very experienced pilot. And he had just picked up this plane, as, from what I understand, um, and had, do, had done a lap in the Monterey, or was it Monterey, I think, or not Monterey, but the airport across the bay in Monterey. Uh, what was it? The Pacific Grove, yeah. Yeah, there's an airport right across the peninsula. And, um, and like I mentioned, he... It, it, it was a new aircraft to him, so he probably, he may not have understood the fuel consumption rate of the aircraft or just wasn't used to it. So he had starved one of the tanks and went to switch the other tank, and the tank happened to starve as he was pretty low, in low altitude. And when he re reached back to, uh, to grab the fuel selector, he pushed on the rudder pedal, and that caused the plane to, to uh, crash at that point. So this one, um, again, somebody with a lot of experience, I guess you could say, in this case, um, you know, the pilot looking at his own experience might have said, you know, I should probably get, I should probably get more time in this plane or get more familiar with it. Um, certainly the fact that he starved the fuel tanks is really surprising for someone with that much experience, but, you know, that can happen. And um, it's a real, it's a really, that's another tragic loss, but um, that may have been prevented just by taking the time to think about um, conditions under which you're taking that flight. So, 
Um, I think I'm at 6.40, 6.40, so I got 45 minutes. Uh, do you guys want to look at another story or go on to the next topic? What do you think? We can talk about JFK Jr. I can talk about Kobe Bryant a little bit too. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I read a big report on this one because A, it's the same plane I fly um, practically. Ours is turbocharged, but it's, it's practically the same aircraft. Um, and he, he wasn't instrument rated and he was flying at night. He didn't have a huge amount of nighttime. And he also had done a lot of flying with a CFI aboard. Um, I think he was working on an instrument rating. And this was a case where he, the, he said that he, would, he, he wanted to do this flight by himself. I don't think it was, there would have been enough room for the CFI because I think the plane had um, four people total in it in a Saratoga that's, that's right there. So, um, so it, it's surprising, but it, once you get up to a certain altitude and then it's hazy and foggy, there's, um, even if it's not IMC, you can't really make the ground out really well over water and certainly not the horizon. And even at a, at a certain distance away from cities, stars and, and if you can see uh, uh, lights of the city on the ground, there, there isn't sometimes a really defined horizon. So this could be a case where he was at night, um, you know, got in some haze and uh, just basically lost track of up and down. And, and if you haven't done a lot of instrument flying and trust your instruments, look at that artificial horizon and, um, you know, uh, just used to scanning your instruments because the artificial horizon alone doesn't tell you a story. It's everything, your airspeed, your bank, um, your vertical speed indicator. Uh, if you have a moving map, that'll tell you what things are going on too. You're going the wrong way. So if you're not used to that and you're used to flying outside of the plane, this is something that can just happen. In fact, you know, not looking at any of the instruments for half a minute can really put you in a serious configuration without you even feeling it. Um, the G-forces and, and everything, just you just feel like you're level. And then all of a sudden you look down and you're like at a, you know, I mean, I've done it in five, five seconds, less than five seconds. I went over to do something on the GPS and then all of a sudden the plane was at a 25 degree bank and you don't feel it. So it's really important that you, you have that scan and you do that uh, scan, but if you're not in the practice of doing it, um, it's pretty easy to get yourself disoriented in conditions like this. And as a matter of fact, in other countries, you're required to have an instrument rating to fly at night. The U.S. is one of the countries that doesn't require that. You just need to have a certain amount of number of takeoffs and landings um, at night to stay current in or, in, and to stay current in order to carry passengers with you. So it's interesting that, that other countries do require that, and so they clearly know there's some dangers with flying at night. And uh, it's not something to take lightly. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else interesting about this story. Um, I mean, he had he'd been flying a few, quite long into the flight when this happened. It wasn't like it happened right after takeoff. So he was he was en route, pretty solid en route. Um, this is the other one I talked about earlier. This is that operator. Um, I think I covered this enough. It's pretty gruesome. Um, the interesting thing, though, to read, and I mean, it's a sad incident, but when you read the probable cause, it's kind of like, yeah, <laughs> that's what happened. Um, anyhow. Um, but yeah, again, this is just something, uh, yeah, it's probably safe to run the engines in most cases and let people come in and out of the plane. But here's a case where it wasn't normal. The, this was a twin. It wasn't the single engine. and the operator themselves wasn't even thinking about it. And you can see how high the, um, how the props are here. So you can imagine if uh, you're thinking a single, you can just come right up to the window. This prop spinning that high, you probably wouldn't even see the prop. So it's, you know, it can be really dangerous. Sometimes the best thing to do is just shut the engines down. Um, and I think in this case too, he wasn't looking. He was like looking down at his flight plan or something when the, op, the, the, the agent came out to the plane. So um, I, this could be a case of situational awareness, right? He wasn't, 
he was fixated on one thing but wasn't thinking about everything else that's going around. And you have running engines like that. If he is gonna do that, definitely see if anyone's like around or coming around here, people running out into the ramp area um, all the time. You, you just never know. So um, really sad that that, that that happened. So if you're, if you're interested in more accidents, you can go to the NTSB's website um, they have uh, aviation accidents uh, categorized. It's a, you know, it's it's a good database. I look at them just to say, okay, is this something I do? And you know, what happens? Somebody did something. It's like, oh, I see that's a flaw in, in how I behave, and I I need to correct that because these consequences can happen. If you're just honest with yourself and you read these stories and think about how you can be a better pilot and learn from that so that these people's deaths aren't in, in vain. Um, it's kind of the attitude I have. So there's tons of them. The, the, the one I pulled up at the end there is just a random click. I literally just picked a year and a month and then found that story um, and figured, hey, well, let's learn something from it. You know, let's make that person's life not you know, a, a loss just because of an accident like that. So. Um, the accident cases are really good. The AOPA um, has a series, the Air Safety Institute does an analysis of accidents and they talk about the whole phases of flight and what happened, what probably happened. They're really, really great videos. Um, it's a, a whole channel of, of videos about accidents and they're really concise. They don't kind of go on for a long time. They kind of get down to the point and cover the important part of, of what happened. And I, I find those really, really um, useful to watch, informative. And as I mentioned, this whole idea of ADM is so new. It's, it's surprising um, it hasn't been part of flight training. And I think this is the reason why there's such a huge chapter in the front of the book. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, um, it, it is, it, it, I, I used to think, well, it wasn't part of my original flight training. I was like, well, I, you know, I don't know about this stuff. But I found it does really help. And when, I, when we were running the uh, flying club, we would actually look at members who wanted to fly planes they hadn't flown in six months and say, you know, do you guys qualify under, under ADM guidelines, like looking at PAVE and, and all those things. And sometimes we'd have to tell pilots, like, look, we know you're checked out in this plane, but you haven't flown it in nine months. So, you know, you're going to have to go get a, at least go up with a CFI and do a few landings before we can let you take it out. Yeah. Um, Regulations are built on blood, sweat, and tears of our aviation history. <laughs> so if you think about when the Wright brothers, there was no regulations, you know. And the fact that they were able to fly, you know, those many flights without a serious accident is amazing. Um, a testament to their professionalism and, and how serious they, they understood flying was. So um, I was, like, really surprised. It's a good, good read. The Wright brothers, the McCulloch Wright brothers book is a really good read. Um, just talks about them starting up from their printing press to their bicycle shop to sort of secretly working on the airplane. It's pretty cool. <laughs> um, all right, on to okay. So yeah, this is what's important for the written test. Um, knowing the definition of ADM, what it means. There'll be questions on that. There'll be questions around pave. <clears throat> um, the hazardous attitudes that we've covered. There's also dangerous tendencies, which kind of falls into the category of hazardous attitudes, but they specifically highlight scud running. Um, scud running is flying, uh, not, not filing IFR and flying VFR, but just below the clouds. Um, flying VFR into M IMC. This is actually you know, part of what happened with the Kobe Bryant incident. He was on a VFR flight plan, ended up in IMC. And actually going from visual conditions into IMC, if you're not thinking about it and your head's not in it, it's, it's um, a shock. <laughs> so uh, it's no surprising a lot of accidents happen because of that. And lack of using checklists is the other thing that they mentioned. Because um, then you won't miss items. Um, certainly miss things like turning the alternator on which I did one time. I took off with just the battery, and then as I'm flying out, it's like, ah, the alternator's not on. Click. Um, so checklists are, are very helpful. 
Um, and then there is a section, yeah, about automation and complacency. I think there's maybe one question about automation. Since we have a lot of new and shiny electronics nowadays in our airplanes, uh, you can let, you can, it can let you let the plane do a lot of things, but you still need to maintain situational awareness and, and understand what, what the automation is doing. I have another personal example there. We had the autopilot engaged and told it to fly an 800 foot per minute climb. It, the only problem was that the airplane wasn't capable of doing that. So what happened about four minutes into our departure is the plane stalled. <laughs> the stall horn went off. Yeah, so pop off the autopilot and like, what, what was it doing? What well, was doing what I told it to do? So um, yeah. And I think a lot of times they won't even show you the autopilot system in flight training until you've got a few hours. It's not an end-all be-all. A lot of people will go out and buy Cirruses and just use the autopilot the whole time, which is, I don't know, that's a, that's a way to fly. So <laughs> it's surprising though, it's just, yeah. yeah. You need to, yeah, you need to know what you want done and then you need to see if the automation is doing what you asked it to or not. But you have to have that situational awareness. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. I feel like also let's not do something that's on the flight. <laughs> I mean, it helps. It helps probably immensely. However, <laughs> I feel like it's So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, 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 they're important topics, but we've covered them now. Um, do you, do you guys like the way this was presented? I mean, did you see how it's practical and how it applies to the real world? Um, you could even sit down and look at that, that helicopter accident with Kobe Bryant and think in terms of ADM and say, you know, and if you read the NTSB report, I bet you could even look at it and say, yeah, I see all these things from ADM, you know, that weren't, weren't done or weren't followed or weren't even used. Amazing how many pilots with lots of experience don't even um, think about ADM. So, so it's a good way to start. Let's crash some planes now. Let's go fly them. So. <laughs> um, all right, we're doing good. 6:52. I'm right where I want to be right now. So I don't know if anyone had any comments or questions on Slack. I have the thread open. So was there no nothing? Okay. All right. Um, so airplane construction. Yeah, cool, man. Again, some of this stuff's gonna seem pedestrian because <laughs> we're gonna talk about, oh, a propeller and a fuselage and the empennage and all that. So I'm gonna try to at least make it interesting and, and uh, talk about some of the weirder things on airplanes that aren't just the typical stuff. Because um, a lot of that basic stuff is in, in, in the fact as well. Um, <laughs> Brian Slack said, I like it. It's like war stories. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so uh, construction, yeah. We'll talk about airworthiness. That's kind of important. Uh, basically, the FAA has a set of uh, guidelines for building airplanes um, and maintaining them. Then um, we'll talk about some of the concepts of, uh, of, um, of flight with construction. That's in a whole other section later. Uh, but then we'll talk about just the components of the airplane. There is a really weird written test question too I found when I was going through the Glime book and I was like, really, you guys asked that? So we'll talk about that one. Um, so airworthiness standards. Um, there's a set of regulations that cover the propeller, the engine, and the airframe. And you'll typically find that an aircraft has all three of these logbooks um, maintained. Now, they're not necessarily three separate logbooks, but they are separate sections. They usually are three separate books. So anytime work is done on the engine, that, that gets logged in a logbook. Uh, oil changes for even oil changes and more serious things, spark plugs or uh, uh, exhaust valves. Um, you know, lines replaced. Anything that deals with the engine has its own logbook. Uh, propellers uh, typically have to be overhauled or replaced, just like engines do as well. So there's guidance on what has to happen. I mean, a propeller is a hugely important thing. It has a lot of momentum on it. 
And thinking back to that, uh, uh, the Wright Flyer accident in 1908, the propeller came apart, you know, so there was no guidance for how propellers should be constructed back then. So there, it's, it's a pretty important thing. If your propeller flies apart, um, yeah, your plane's not gonna uh, explode or anything, but you're not gonna be able to use the engine and it's not gonna do you much good. So um, propellers are obviously part of that, that specification. And then the airframe governs just anything else that's part of the aircraft. Um, so when a manufacturer makes the plane, it's issued an airworthiness certificate. So the FAA says, yeah, you followed the guidelines. Um, was it these 777 MAX? Got an airworthiness certificate. Even though they ended up stopped making them, it got one. Um, but that's there's another aspect as I talk about too. So when when the uh, when the aircraft is made, the FAA approves it. It gets an airworthiness certificate, and that's good for the life of the aircraft until you know they decide they don't they'll, they'll retract it for re one reason or another. But usually, what happens is they amend the airworthiness with something called a, an airworthiness directive in AD. But that certificate itself, it needs to be kept with the aircraft, and it's it's good for the perpetuity of the aircraft. Um, so you'll keep these maintenance records. That's part of um, what has to be noted. Uh, when you take a plane to get maintained, uh, um, a mechanic has to be an authorized FAA mechanic to work on any part of that plane, the airframe, engines, propellers, even avionics guys. And they'll make a note in the logbook saying what the repair was, the date, and their certificate number will go in that logbook. So I can bring example logbooks in for the next class if you guys want to see what they look like. They're kind of boring, but it's just pages with signatures and information. It's important when you go buy a plane that you have the logs. And I had a little asterisk on this slide, but used planes sometimes don't have their logbooks, which is interesting. And you go to buy a used plane, you'd like to know the history of what's been done on that aircraft. But in some cases, logbooks get lost, especially on older planes. They just don't have them anymore. Um, people are scanning them now in digitally. Uh, there's also a service that will do digital logbooks entirely uh, with, for your maintenance, and that's sanctioned by the FAA. So I personally have uh, paper logbooks. I just scan them as I get stuff done and then put that up in Dropbox or some drive location where I can get at them. Um, so there are, are these exceptions that I mentioned. So one type of exception is a service bulletin. And this is something that a manufacturer will, will issue, and it's a recommendation usually. Um, if it doesn't mean you have to do it, but some could be like, uh, we recommend you inspect, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of something good. <laughs> like, let's say there were reports of um, uh, cabin uh, heat pipe breaking or something, like a few reports. Um, well, that can carry carbon monoxide. So the service bulletin might say, we recommend you inspect the cabin heating ducts every you know, 300 hours for cracks or, or something like that. Because so that'd be a service bulletin. So let's say like a, people start dying from this or passing out and stuff, then the FAA says, you know what? It's not a service bulletin anymore. Now it's an airworthiness directive. So you have 100 hours to comply with. You need to replace that cabin heating duct with a completely different component. And then sometimes the manufacturer will give you some sort of a rebate or a discount to help with that. Um, but that means that your plane isn't uh, airworthy. It doesn't comply. It has to have that directive complied with. And when you own a plane, you'll typically register for the FAA to get notified if there's any airworthiness directives that'll affect you, and they'll do it by serial number of your plane. So if your plane is a serial number, you have to comply with this airworthiness directive. So something to think about when you go rent a plane, you can ask, <laughs> you can ask the place when you rent the plane, like, uh, so, you know, you guys, is your, does your plane comply with all the airworthy, or airworthiness directives, and, you know, um, you know, are you, are you maintaining your annuals? I happen to know some rental places that <clears throat> fell out of annual and still rented the plane. So just gotta be careful with rental places, you know, make sure it's somebody you trust and uh, 
you know, <laughs> it, it, it's sad that you would have to check up on them, um, kind of trusting them to do flight training. But it's good to know these things and going into flight training to say, you know, are your guys, are your planes up to snuff? You know, are you, are you complying with airworthy, or airworthiness directives? Um, only certain types of flight schools will the FAA actually check up on these guys. So there's, there's different categories of flight schools. Um, there's one in Van Nuys that, uh, and they had lots of trouble. And I'm not going to say their name, but yeah. <laughs> they actually had the FAA sniffing around them. So. Um, so it's good to know that you guys know this when you go, uh, go to flight training. An STC is a uh, type certificate. So uh, these are what let you put cool new stuff in your airplane. So uh, for example, you buy a plane, it's got all steam gauges, uh, instruments in it, you know, round dials, and you want to put something cool like this glass panel thing on it. To actually put it in your plane, unless it's an experimental, but if you're flying with passengers and doing IMC, you have to have a type certificate for it. It's a, uh, basically an authorization for aftermarket equipment. So it's called an STC, a type certificate. And then it will have additional information about that installation in your aircraft specifically. Um, there's um, a case too where if you do fall out of compliance, you can get a waiver. Uh, usually they're, they're pretty, not pretty easy to get, but they're not, um, it's understandable. So an example of a waiver might be, let's say your plane fell out of annual and you need to get it somewhere, you can file for a waiver. Um, or uh, if your transponder is not working and you need to fly through some controlled airspace that requires a transponder, you can get a waiver for that. Um, those ones are a little easier to get. Uh, but uh, that's kind of it on airworthiness. That topic, I mean, that's kind of regulations, and we'll talk about that more. But when talking about how airplanes are built and just understanding that the FAA does oversee that and regulate it, it's important, um, you know, kind of introduction to the, to the aircraft construction topic. Uh, so different structure types of airplanes. Well, a monoplane is just a single winged plane, you know, one wing. <laughs> it's called a monoplane. I didn't actually know that until I started, you know, reading about this stuff again. I uh, just figured, oh, it's a, you know, it's not a biplane. So it's a mono wing. So there's low wings, high wings. Uh, most of the Piper planes, uh, Beechcraft, Diamond, Cirrus, they're all low wings. High wings are typically Cessnas. The Cub, Piper Cub is a tail wheel high wing. Uh, Cetabria is another tail wheel. Um, the high wings, you typically will see them in uh, doing cargo uh, because the wings are up. You can load the plane in pretty easy. Even like some of the UPS plane, the big, not the big cargo jets, but some of the uh, regional cargo planes are high wings. Um, typically find them in the, in the bush because, or out in, you know, um, the wilderness. Because they have high wings, they'll have the props up high. You'll even see tail wheels a lot. It's just more clearance from brush and things around the bottom of the plane. Um, also in the tropics, uh, a lot of the seaplanes they fly in the tropics are, uh, are high wing. Biplanes, you don't see them a heck of a lot anymore. Um, they're either vintage planes or they're aerobatic, but two of the ones that are common nowadays are the, uh, you still see Great Lakes biplanes, and I think it's an open cockpit biplane. They're kind of cool looking. And then uh, Pitt Special is a pretty cool looking plane. I don't know if I had a picture of a Pitt Special here somewhere. Oh yeah, it's in the background. <laughs> the watermark, can't see it. Um, but they're really cool single pilot like aerobatic planes. They look pretty badass. Um, as far as like the body composition, uh, an open truss, you don't see those too often anymore, but you do see them, but you mostly it was on um, um, earlier aircraft. And that's uh, simply just, it doesn't have a skin around the fuselage. So it'll just have the wings and the control surfaces skinned. Um, and in order to re, since the, the skin of the plane's not reinforcing those other parts, you'll often see a lot of stringers. So the, um, the right flyer was open truss. The wing was fabric, covered in fabric. Uh, and that gave the wing some st stability. So what's more common is this, um, <laughs> it's, I had to look up the pronunciation of it, but it is, it's monocoque. It is, um, and it's semi-monocoque. Uh, 
So that is the skin. Uh, so in a monocoque, the skin actually uh, is a significant portion of the structural integrity of the aircraft. A semi-monocoque, it uses uh, ribbing as well um, and some types of stringers uh, to reinforce uh, the body. But the skin is part of the structural integrity. Um, this is the case with a lot of composites too. So a composite aircraft is fiberglass. Um, or some sort of fiber reinforced material. And you see these a lot, a lot more lately in the last 20 years. Um, they, did, they did have some composites back in, I think in post-World War II, they were experimenting with it. But they're, they're pretty popular now. If you guys heard of Cirrus aircraft, those are composites. And Diamond Star uh, makes a composite. Diamond Star is a plane I've flown. I flew the DA-40. It's pretty cool. I've been wanting to get my hands on a Cirrus. I haven't flown one of those. So um, very lightweight, um, very slick. The skin's super smooth. There's no rivets. So um, they're really good on fuel economy. Um, the Cirrus doesn't even do retractable gear, I think, because the thing's so fast, they don't need, they don't need to, <laughs> um, at least in that category of plane, anyhow. Uh, so. Uh, that's kind of it on structure types. Oh yeah, we're gonna talk about some aerodynamic things. Um, so a force is um, it from your, your high school science class. <laughs> force will accelerate an object in the direction it is applied. So if you push on something, it will, if you keep pushing with force, it will keep accelerating in that direction. Um, so if you're pushing something along to get it up to a certain speed, right, eventually you're just going to be moving it at that speed. So you're really not applying, where well, you're applying a force that overcomes um, the friction at that point. So you're not increasing the speed anymore. So this is important to understand. So when two forces are opposite and equal, an object will remain at constant velocity, constant speed. So, and that includes at rest. So something is sitting on the table, force of gravity is pulling it down, but the force of the table is keeping it at rest. Just, just like when you push this object, eventually you're going to accelerate it into motion, but once you get to the point where you're just moving it along at a constant speed, that friction in your, the force of your hand are the two forces acting against each other, and it's just going to keep going at that same, um, that same velocity, that speed. It's not going to accelerate in either direction. We have a, a Slack question there. We do. Is it, in the, is it in the thread, like I told you people? No, it's just in the general. OK. <laughs> Do you uh, let's see here if I can pull it up? It's just in the general lesson discussion. OK, get rid of that. Who's about? Or if they can post it, please post it in the thread. Just copy it and post it in the thread. <laughs> um, There's a question about mid-wing aircraft. Mid-wing? Oh, no. Well, I don't know. There are mid-wing aircraft. There is a uh, there is a mention of it in the fact. So uh, I don't know if there's anything special about it. I didn't include it in the slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll look it up and I'll see if there's anything more interesting about mid-wing aircraft worth mentioning. Um, so uh, so the four big forces, the four name forces uh, in in flight are thrust, drag, lift, and weight. So thrust the thing pulling you forward, drag the thing pulling you, well, backwards. Could be backwards, could be any direction really, but it is backwards. Lift, um, the, flight, the flying component that actually takes you up into the air, and then weight, gravity, acting on the plane. Um, these are, again, this is just terms that we're gonna need to talk about aircraft construction, aircraft um, performance. Center gravity, just the stability of the aircraft, just like if you were to hang it and balance it, that would be the point on a string that it would balance on. Uh, center of lift is actually the location where the lifting force acts, and it's not always at the center of gravity. Um, and we'll find out center of gravity can move depending on how you load fuel and cargo into an aircraft. So the motions that we always talk about are pitching motions, rolling, Sometimes people say banking, but man, I got into heated debates about banking versus rolling when I searched online, so we better just call it rolling. Um, and then yaw, which is uh, 
the pitching motion, obviously, what is your up and down motion, uh, and the rolling is, you know, side to side like that. And then yaw is sort of like this fishtailing, fishing thing. Um, and these occur through the center of gravity. So here's some diagrams from the handbook. Again, we see the, the four forces acting on it, and then we see the, uh, the three motion behaviors uh, occurring across the, the different axes. And they'll talk about these, um, they'll talk about the axes as well in some of the questions. So, you know, knowing the, the lateral longitudinal and the vertical axis will be part of questions in the uh, written test. So which axis belongs with which motion is something you'll need to, to know. 710, I have five minutes. Uh, so some of the aircraft uh, terminology. Um, the power plant considers the engine and the propeller, uh, the cowling and the ventilation. It's what provides the thrust in the aircraft. The power plant can be a jet. Uh, it can be in the back of the plane. It can be in the front of the plane. Um, it can be something weird that I haven't even seen that they call a power plant. <laughs> but for the purposes of flight training and initial flight training, it's the big engine in the front with the propeller on it. Um, fuselage, that's, everyone knows what a fuselage is, but it's where the pilot and the passenger sit, it's the flight deck, it's avionics, what they call the car, the cabin is there, the cargo, all the cargo is part of the fuselage. Typically you'll find the battery in the fuselage, like in the back somewhere. Sometimes batteries can be in all weird places, but surprisingly not always in the power plant area. Um, autopilot servos will be in the fuselage, um, some of them, uh, most often. Um, the antennas will be attached to the fuselage. They'll also be attached to the empennage in the back. And then um, sometimes fuel can be carried in there. I know someone who flew a 172 from Santa Barbara to Hawaii. And they put fuel in the wings, and they put fuel, and they took all the seats out and put fuel in and shipped the seats to Hawaii. And there's people that do this all the time in like groups. So it's pretty interesting. You fly for 24 hours, you can do it. Um, <laughs> wings typically have the fuel. Um, they also have these things called ailerons. Uh, we'll talk more about that in control surfaces, uh, controls section, um, flaps which can aid in uh, increasing lift in certain phases of flight. Winglets we'll see on uh, commercial aircraft. There's those little things that stick off at the end and pop up, and they actually prevent uh, the vortices from uh, inducing further drag. It reduces the drag caused by wingtip vortices um, in the fuel tanks. So the wings are responsible for lift and rolling. And empennage is the really, uh, has a lot of function. <laughs> uh, horizontal and vertical stabilizers are there. Um, sometimes you'll see a V-tail shape empennage. This is like that bonanza that we saw uh, in the, died, yeah, the music died plane had the V-tail. Um, you'll also see a T-tail, which is um, the, and you'll see this in some big uh, private jets too have these, but the, the um, horizontal stabilizers on the top instead of like, you know, down below at the bottom. Um, also is the rudder, which is on the vertical stabilizer. Um, and then the elevator and trim and, and are on, attached to the elevator, or sometimes there's a stabilator. So my aircraft actually has a stabilator and it has an anti-servo on that stabilator, which are both questions in the written test <laughs> for some reason. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the Piper Saratoga, the Piper a lot of the Piper planes have a stabilator. Um, that's an entire um, horizontal, uh, horizontal stabilizer that moves. So it acts as the function of the elevator as well as the um, stabilizer at the same time. And it has this anti-servo tab which goes in the opposite direction. So as you move that, that stabilator down, it goes up and then vice versa. And the trim is actually attached to that, um, that anti-servo to do trimming. So the empennage will control your pitch and your yaw. So you see how all the components are, you know, kind of answering the questions about those different motions and forces. The landing gear, obviously very important. It's your struts, your wheels, 
uh, your brakes. Uh, sometimes there's skis, sometimes there's floats. Sometimes there's skids, that's the right flyer, or helicopters. Those things that they grab onto in the movies are called skids. Uh, <laughs> has anyone grabbed onto a skid? No, no one? Yeah, me either. So, um, I think that's it for this section, so we'll take a 15 minute break. Um, and I can look on, if there's any questions about any of the topics we've covered right now, I can check out the um, Slack channel. So we'll meet back here at 7.30. Groovy? Groovy. All right. Phillips 1475, tower 33.9. Can't hear me. Now you can hear me. All right. Monocoque. Yep. <laughs> yeah, monocoque. That's right. Semi monocoque. There, I got the chickens. <laughs> That's a mono. Semi mono cluck, right? And it's a low wing. It is a low wing. It's not a mid wing, as far as I know. Ryan. Thank you, Ryan, for that question. <laughs> That guy. All right, so we had gone over the um, components of the aircraft. And then I know the biggest question on everyone's mind was the fuselage, but I hope we cleared that up. So, <laughs> um, all right, so let's look at this little diagram here with just the diagram. Um, yeah, so this in the fact book. Right, just identifies the areas. And like I said, the power plant doesn't always in the front of the plane. It can be in the back. I think that long easy was a backwards plane, like the engine was pushing it, the plane. And it had like a, sometimes you'll see that the fuselage, the horizontal stabilizer thingy is actually in the front of the plane. And that's called a canard. That's in the written for whatever reason. Um, a C-A-N-A-R-D um, when, uh, when it's located up at the front like that. Um, I did talk about the stabilator, so that's a case where the horizontal uh, stabilizer is also the elevator and has an anti-servo on it. Again, two words on the written for whatever reason that they do that. I think they're just trying to trick you, so that's how the FAA is. Um, all right, so we'll talk about the power plant. Um, again, it's what produces the thrust and it's through the engine and the propeller. In the basic case, we're not talking about edge cases here, just the type of plane most of us will fly when we start flying. And um, the engine compartment again, cowling, the ventilation, the firewall, which protects you from the heat of the engine in the cabin. Um, also provides cabin heating, and I only mention that because that's where um, people can get carbon monoxide poisoning, so, um, heating ventilation. One of the things they say if you're <clears throat> you have sense that you have uh, carbon monoxide is close the vents uh, from the engine compartment. Um, the propeller is an airfoil. So there's all these surfaces that are shaped aerodynamically to provide lift uh, in some way are called airfoils. So I don't know if technically you can call the horizontal stabilizer an uh, airfoil, but um, the elevator is an airfoil. Propeller is an airfoil. Um, and it has that that characteristic you would see on a wing, and it's twisted, and that's so that there's an even, what we call angle of attack all along the propeller. That's why they twist it like that. So the idea that the blade is taking a similar type of cut at the air at, at every length along it, so it has this twist in it. Um, there's two kinds of propellers you find a fixed pitch, which is the blade angle is fixed, um, and you can't change it, and most training Planes are lower-powered aircraft, like planes that have less than 180 horsepower will have a fixed-pitch propeller. Um, it's designed for like the majority of the flight phases that you'll use the uh, engine for, the aircraft for. Uh, the other type is a constant speed, um, but now we're starting to see that in training planes, and that allows the uh, speed, the rotation speed of the uh, engine to be controlled by controlling the pitch of the blades on the propeller. And what that lets you do is adjust the engine performance for different phases of flight uh, to get better fuel burn and uh, better performance out of the aircraft. The spinner is that little 
pointy thing that looks like something from a Madonna video in the 80s on the tip <laughs> of the propeller. <laughs> so that's, that's called the spinner. Um, that's part of pre-flighting is actually checking that that thing's not going to come flying off. So, um, which, which just is, it's kind of rude if it comes off during flight, it can go through the windshield. <laughs> um, wings, again, wing is an airfoil. Uh, obviously the big airfoil. So that's the one that generates the force of lift, most of the lift. Um, and it supports the aircraft in flight, obviously keeps it there. Ailerons appear on the wings, and those are the control surface for controlling the rolling, not banking, banking motion that um, we talked about earlier. Um, the left and right operate in the opposite direction. So what happens is that an up aileron, up aileron will force the wing down, and then a down one will bring that wing up. And it's really what it's doing is it's actually changing the characteristic of the wing at that position. It's generating more lift by going down, which raises the wing. And then by turning the aileron up, it's not generating as much lift, which lowers the wing. Uh, play may or may not have uh, flaps on them. Some smaller, slower planes actually don't have flaps. Uh, so the, a lot of the training planes, though, now have flaps, which basically change the lift character, characteristic of the, of the wing, close, close to the root of the wing. And that allows you to have more lift in slow phases of flight. So coming in into approach, you can slow down the aircraft more. Um, and then for shorter runways, you can use less runway. So if you've flown on a commercial flight in a window next to a wing, You've probably seen all manner of crazy things fly out of that wing. <laughs> There's spoilers. The leading edge of the wing will go forward. That will, basically the wing grows like to this huge thing. So that plane can slow down and use less runway to land. A lot safer to land at a, sl a slower airspeed without um, risking a stall. But it's not very good for flight because having a big wing like that induces a lot of drag and you can't go as fast. So like that. And then when it comes in for landing, opens the whole thing up, slows you down, right down on the runway. Um, the wing also normally, like I mentioned before, houses fuel. And there's these things called tip tanks. You'll see some airplanes with these big, like, torpedo-looking things on the end. They're actually not bombs that they're going to drop. They're, they're, <laughs> they're uh, fuel tanks for extended, or extended uh, fuel tanks, typically. Um, they might be bombs on some planes, but <laughs> the ones I'm talking about are actually, uh, yeah, they're actually fuel tanks. But if it's filled with fuel, technically, is it it's a bomb, bomb kind of, it, it could be. It depends what your plan is. So, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, some supplemental things. Uh, so I talked a little bit about the winglets before. Uh, you'll see them, they kind of stick out on the tips of some commercial flights. But now you're seeing people actually put winglets on smaller planes, kind of interesting. Uh, wing spoilers, those, <laughs> this is mentioned in the written. Oh my God, they have a question <laughs> about spoilers, but um, spoiler, the, alert. The spoiler alert, there's a spoiler question. I like that, good job, Kevin. Um, I'll give you, I will give you this for that one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, yeah, the wing spoilers are basically induced drag, and like, why would you want to do that? Well, only the large, these large jets that are trying to s slow themselves down to come into the approach phase um, have, have these to slow them because there's speed restrictions below 10,000 feet. So if a big jet's screaming in at 400 miles an hour and he goes below 10,000 feet, he's got to play nice with all of us small planes flying around and slow down. So spoilers are a way to do that. Uh, another thing you're seeing a lot on uh, planes, even small planes, is these vortex generators. Um, there's a really good video on YouTube where a guy explains this. Uh, if anyone's interested, I can send it to you. When he um, took little strings and attached them uh, on, on his car, and he put these vortex generators on the roof of his car to see how the air would um, function with them without the spoilers. But uh, now I'm trying to remember what the heck they do. <laughs> Not the spoilers, the uh, vortex generators. 
Uh, Ryan probably knows. He knows. He knows everything about this. I can't remember. And I looked it up, and I'm supposed to remember. Well, I should have left myself more notes. Um, anyhow, uh, vortex generators, sometimes you'll see them. What they look like is they look like a little channel. And oh, I remember now. It's, uh, it delays the early boundary separation of the airflow. So we'll talk about that later. That's why I didn't say anything about it now. <laughs> but um, I guess it can, it, can delay, um, it, can, it can delay the stall of the wing by having these vortex generators uh, on the top. But they're like, they're like this big, uh, high. They're little, thin little tabs. I mean, uh, people online can't, can't see me. But they're like little, thin little tabs like this, kind of in a V, and they're all along the top of the wing. Kind of an interesting doodad. Oh, Ryan doesn't know what vortex generators are. <laughs> Woohoo, finally! <laughs> uh, <laughs> He's Googling it right now. He is, right, yeah. There's a good video. I'll throw, I'll throw it in there. Guy did a great job analyzing. Even had like, like, you know, simulations and CAD and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, so back to the uh, empennage, empennage. It is what helps to maintain the stability and the coordination of the aircraft in flight. So this will keep you from yawing out of control or pitching out of control. Um, an example of a failure in an elevator is the Alaska Airlines accident in uh, 2000 off the coast of Oxnard, where the Acme nut failed on the elevator and they had they basically lost complete control of the elevator at that point and that's why that aircraft crashed um, so they had no they had no stability um, <laughs> there it is Ryan posted it thanks um, they have no stability oh you posted it oh Russell posted it Ryan got credit for Russell's post sorry <laughs> Everyone's to taking credit. Bread, Kevin. Uh, uh, bread. <laughs> so the um, so in the case of the Alaska flight, there there was this was actually something that was approved by the FAA that ended up failing. Uh, so consequently, the FAA was actually partly responsible for some of that accident. I guess that's what I remember reading. I don't hold me to it, but it was definitely an elevator failure in that case. Um, so critical in maintaining that uh, stability. Uh, again, they called them both airfoils. They did call the um, vertical stabilizer an airfoil, and the horizontal stabilizer is an airfoil like a wing and like the propeller. Uh, the rudder is that control surface that appears on the vertical stabilizer, and it's used for yawing motion. So that yawing motion is that sort of fishtailing motion. Um, this is important for coordinating flight. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, the elevator then is the used for the pitching motion, like I mentioned. I mentioned the sta stabilator with the anti servo. It also has these trim tabs. The trim tab is a, f a control surface on the control surface that moves the control surface in the opposite direction. So if you can imagine the elevator goes down like that, that pushes the tail up, which causes you to pitch down. And then opposite, if you push it up, it pushes the tail down, causing you to fly up. But if you're in a constant climb, you're going to have to hold back pressure on the yoke to maintain that climb. And what that little trim tab will do is it creates a, another flap in the opposite direction to basically force the elevator to go into that uh, position. So it'll actually you know, maintain that position. So when you trim a plane out, what you're doing is you're relieving some of that force that you would actually have to put on the elevator by basically flipping this little flap up that pushes it in the opposite direction. So you see trim wheels um, are used uh, quite a bit to, to lessen the workload in a flight. It's a tool to lessen the work, workload. Uh, again, I mentioned the V-tails and the, and the T-tail planes. If you look up a Bonanza before the 70s, most of them have V-tails. Um, T-tails, I think there's even some Pipers that have T-tails. But when you see a T-tail, it's like, oh, because you don't see them that often. So, um, Landing gear, really important. So the ones that are under the wings are the mains. They just call them the mains, the main gear. Um, the landing gear, you think, well, yeah, it's a, it's a no-brainer, but it supports. Uh, and shocks the plane during landing and, and during taxiing. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot more to the gear than just 
tires and you know taxiing around it actually does protect the propeller and the tail from ground strikes so one thing that people really kind of underappreciate is proper inflation on your tires and proper um, pressure in your shock absorbers because if both of those are low you can mess up your propeller um, or you can strike the tail of the aircraft uh, so and and this can this can happen just taxiing around, not only just landing, but taxiing and you hit a nice big crack in the concrete somewhere, you know, and your plane will go like that. And people have done it just taxiing around. Fwing! You hear this like fwing sound. That means your uh, propeller hit the ground and you should not go fly at that point. Your flight day is over. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so that's why it's important to check the tire pressure and, and check um, the strut, struts. Um, so steering uh, on the, around the ground is usually done with differential braking, almost always done with differential braking of some kind. Um, in, a ta in some tailwheel planes, you can do it solely by manipulating the rudder because uh, that's going to cause the tail to swing around and you really don't need to do a lot of differential braking, but differential braking will absolutely help you tighten the turn and there's just, there's just separate independent left and right brakes on the tires. They're usually on the tips of the rudder pedals in practically every plane I've flown. That's where they are. I haven't seen them anywhere else. Um, they might be, but that's where I see them. Uh, again, you can steer, uh, if it doesn't have the castering wheel, you can steer also with the rudder pedals. Um, and that's usually gonna be on a tricycle plane. So, but in the tail wheel, you don't need a steerable wheel because of that rudder action. So there's almost always a castering wheel in the back of a tail wheel. It has no direct control. It's just kind of hanging out there and um, it follows, you know, the direction of the rudder around. So a shopping cart wheel. Yeah, basically. A nose wheel, some nose wheels have castering wheels. The Diamond Star has a castering nose wheel. So differential braking is mostly what you'll be using in a, in a plane like that. Um, right, so what they call a plane that has the, the little wheel in the back and no wheel in the front is a conventional, traditional, or a tail wheel configuration. So the, a lot of planes before the 1950s were tail wheels, even commercial operators are all tail wheels. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. The nose of the plane's up, the props are high off the ground, a lot of unimproved surfaces in the early days of aviation, so having tail wheels makes sense. So we got more improved runways. We started going to a, a nose wheel with a tricycle configuration, which is a lot easier to control. I've been working on a tail wheel uh, uh, endorsement right now, and it's very different <laughs> in a Satabria. So steering the plane around, even landing, um, is way different. So a tricycle configuration is a lot easier to manage on the ground um, and landing than a, than a tail wheel. The tail wheel, like you said, if you want to just fly, uh, that's, that's the flyer's plane, a tail wheel. Definitely hands-on, very involved in the rudder on a tail wheel plane. Uh, other facts, yeah, that's right. See, who thought the landing gear was that interesting, right? <laughs> it's far more interesting than the fuselage. <laughs> Ryan probably did, yeah. Do you guys know that, do you know what wheel fairings are? Is this, was this like a big deal to me? They basically shroud the wheel and they reduce the drag. So they're like little, little puck thingy covers that go over the wheel. The, the funny thing though about wheel, not funny, but the, the thing about wheel fairings is if you're doing a pre-flight inspection on a plane that has a wheel fairings, it's really hard to see if the tire's inflated, which kind of goes back to the whole thing about prop strikes and that. And as a matter of fact, one time uh, in a lesson, um, for com my commercial license, uh, our plane had been, uh, <laughs> somebody had rode the brakes when they landed it and they skinned the tire. And this guy's, I, normally the planes this guy has are great, they don't ever have problems, but the tire got skinned out and then we were taxiing to go take off and a hole got worn on it and it, we had to have it go back and have the tire replaced. But it's, Primarily because the wheel fairings don't let you to do a really good inspection. You have to kind of roll the plane along and like kind of look under it to see that wheel. Um, retractable gear is probably pretty obvious. Um, it reduces drag. You usually find it only in higher speed aircraft. 
And nowadays with, com nowadays with composites, you don't even see retractable gear as much anymore. They are a liability. They're more expensive to maintain. Um, they are pilot error prone as well. So um, now with composites being lighter, they can get some of the same types of airspeed out of the aircraft without having to use retractable gear. But you will typically see wheel fairings on uh, those kinds of aircraft. Uh, some planes have floats. They have, um, instead of tires, they have just these floater things, and those are float planes, uh, seaplanes uh, sometimes. That's a special uh, license, actually, to fly seaplanes. Uh, some of them have both. They are called amphibious floats, so the tires are retractable out of the floats. Um, but reading online, uh, people either love them or hate them. So. Uh, it's, uh, and, and there aren't too many of them, but I, I did see that. Um, skis some, sometimes can replace the tires, or sometimes they'll be attached actually under the tires. So you'll see planes, you'll see the tires sitting on the skis. Interesting. Um, and then skids, as we talked about, the thing that you grab onto in action movies on helicopters is called a skid. So written test key points. Things we talked about airworthiness will appear in the regulations section, some of that stuff. Um, obviously, the components of the plane, because we're creating a library of definitions to, to use in the test. Um, those aerodynamic forces also is a, a terminology, set of terminology that we'll see um, in the rest of the, of the course. Um, the, the motions also are used to describe you know, behaviors. Uh, of the aircraft. So this is this section is really like a terminology thing where we all agree on what these terms are, what they mean. And then those uh, weird written tests, uh, the canard, the stabilator, and the and spoilers. Did I see an anti-servo question too? I might have. But yeah, those were the kind of surprising things I saw in the written. And just so you guys know, like the written, they change it like what's important every year. So that's why these guys come out with a new book. So the FAA has a pool of questions, but none of them will actually be the exact questions on the test. But man, they are very, very close. Um, they're very, very close to the actual written test. So, so they change things out. Like uh, a couple years ago, the type of, of flap was important to them. And now it's, I don't see those questions anymore, like a follower flap and a slotted flap. And, and that was just last year's test, but they don't have them in the pool this year. So, but they do have canard. I don't know if I'm saying that right. It's probably somewhat obscene, like the other word. And then, <laughs> stabilator and spoilers. So, uh, yeah, I think that's it for that section. Um, now we're going to talk about air, <laughs> air, and the principles of aerodynamics. So this this is a fun section. I had a lot of fun actually putting this one together. Um, only because I've read a lot of different ways to describe aer aerodynamics in various different books. I have to say, this guy here, um, he does a good uh, stick and rudder. He's, he, it's written like, <laughs> and, the, and, the photog and, the, and the diagrams are written, it's like written 1950s style and even sounds like it. Like, Hey, therefore, if you fly your plane into the wind, you know, like that kind of thing. So, um, but it's, uh, he's, it's very accessible, uh, you know, description. And this is, you know, this is kind of pre the way the FAA explained things. So, you know, you get a bunch of PhDs, uh, forgive all my friends that are PhDs out there, but um, writing, you know, sections of manuals to describe aerodynamics and they get a little zealous about the terminology. And this guy is very hands-on when it comes to talking about um, aerodynamics. So I kind of took some ideas from his way of writing it and my own understanding of how um, you know, air works in, in flight. And there's so many aspects about this. It's really important that we understand in a fundamental way before we go and look at other things like weather and aircraft performance. So <clears throat> I came up with this idea that, well, let's talk about air as like this little particle guy. He's like a little guy and he's got hands and feet and he's got mass. And our little air particle guy is, um, he, can, he can bump into things and he can push on things. 
things, and we call that pressure, right? He can stick or catch on things. So when things have friction, our little air particle guy grabs on and holds on to things because of friction. And then he can also stick or bump into himself. So if you imagine a bunch of air particle guys holding hands together, that's sort of like viscosity, the viscosity of the air. So thinking about this, that they're little particles that they can push on things, they can catch on things, and they can catch on or stick to or bump into each other. Um, and then we look at Newton. So Newton says uh, some Newtonian physics, really uh, uh, simplified approach to physics, says if I, if I bump into something, it'll bump back, right? If I bump into, like if I go over to Kevin and then push on him, he'll probably push me back. Or I'll feel, you know, something pushing back on me is the idea. So, um, you know, if I push on air, it pushes back. If I bump into air, it bumps back. So you're thinking about air in the sense that it is something that can actually resist movement and, and will push back on you. So how does, how does that translate into, um, you know, flying, right? So we know we need air to, to generate lift. So one part of lift is the wing pushing on the air. So the wing's pushing on the air below it and in front of it, for that matter. But the part that's helping with lift is the bottom of it pushing on the air. And when the wing pushes on the air, the air pushes it back, right? So it's an equal and opposite reaction. That's what Newton says. And in the same case, air is necessary for a propeller to generate thrust. So you, to move the airplane forward, the propeller pushes on the air, right? It's pushing on the air, and the air's pushing back on the propeller, which pushes us forward. Again, this is Newton. So because of that, there's no air in space. You can't fly an airplane there. Sorry. Well, you can't fly an airplane. You could probably drop it and like pretend like you're flying. But, um, you can't actually fly it with flight aerodynamics. So air's viscosity can slow a plane down. So the viscosity, right, I said is um, its tendency to stick to itself, but also its tendency to stick to the plane. So imagine if the air particles are holding hands together because they're sticking to each other or something like that, right? So if you have an air particle that's grabbing onto the wing because of friction and then it's holding on to all of its buddies, that's gonna actually slow down the plane. So that's, that's the friction. So that's called drag, drag. It's a drag, man. So air sticks to itself and your planes are regular surfaces and the skin, we call that parasitic drag. So an airflow over a lift surface can also separate, and that's what this drawing is up in the corner, it can actually separate, and that's the boundary layer. So those vortexes, those vortex generators I was discussing, that actually delays that happening. So that means you can have a higher angle attack before this boundary layer starts separating. So that separation is literally the air sticking to the wing and starting to go in the opposite direction, sticking to itself, and you can see all these little swirlies happening. So the second aspect of lift, I said, is there's this pushing aspect, right? You've got air pushing on. You say, well, yeah, if I'm at a higher angle here of attack, I got more air pushing. So who cares about the stuff on the top? Well, that's the other aspect of, of lift that I'll cover in the next slide. So one thing to consider, too, about air is the density. Um, so as the density decreases, you're gonna have fewer particles of air contributing to any of this, right? So if a less dense air means you have less drag, right? Because there's less air particles dragging on the plane and holding on to each other. But that also means you'll have less thrust out of your propeller because you have less air pushing back on your propeller. And you'll actually have less lift that's the pushing lift from the bottom, which is just a part of, of lift. So density, the, the number of air particles in a volume varies directly with pressure. So the more pressure is, the denser the air is. And inversely with temperature. So the higher the temperature, the less dense the air is. The colder the temperature, the more dense the air is. I like to think of it this way. If we look at our little particle guys, they're all buddies, right? If it's cold out, they want to snuggle up. They want to get together and hang out because it's cold. And then if it's hot, they want to stay away from each other because they're all sweating and they just you know, get away from me. So you can think of density like the temperature density like that. And the pressure density 
you can think of as, as we're closer to Earth, the air pressure is, is a lot greater because there's more air molecules on top of each other getting pushed down to Earth, closer to Earth. And the pressure at sea level in standard conditions, can you imagine, is 50, almost 15 pounds per square inch pushing on your body right now. At, we're not at sea level, but is that crazy to think? There's that much air pushing on you right now, and you don't even know it. Pressure of air is half of that at 18,000 feet. So the air is less dense at 18,000 feet than, it's, than at sea level. So there's that much less air. So flying at 18,000 feet, there's not enough pressure to push air into your lungs. And that's why you need either a pressurized cabin or a supplemental oxygen that has a higher density of oxygen than air does it. Because the, the density of air is lower than the density of oxygen per volume is also lower, right? So having supplemental oxygen makes up for that lack of oxygen count. So you can do that up to a certain altitude. If you've ever seen the jet pilots go way, way up, they have that mass, and that's basically pushing air into their lungs. It's forcing it. It's actually pressurizing it, because the cabin itself is not pressurizing those planes, those classic uh, jet planes. So again, as temperature increases, air becomes less dense. They spread apart. They get more spaced apart. That's too hot. They don't want to hang out near each other. They want to stay away. As temperature decreases, air becomes denser. They want to pack together. They want to cuddle up. So that's important when we start looking at performance. We start thinking about how many bits of air are hitting the surface of the aircraft, either causing drag or causing lift. Um, and that's, that all directly relates to that. So moist air has less air density than dry air because water is taking in the place of air. So we talk about moisture um, as well, like humidity affecting performance and how much air there is. Water doesn't generate lift. It just takes the place of air. So moist air is less air density than dry air because that water is taking the place of the air. Um, this is a lot of stuff to cover. Do I need to slow down on any of this? Is this making sense? Because it's really important. And also anyone on Slack, if you have questions. Um, so this is the big one. This is the other aspect of, um, the other aspect of lift. So we, we know this, but maybe we don't know it directly. But the pressure on one surface of the object becomes, if the pressure on a surface of an object becomes less than the pressure exerted on the other surfaces, the object will move in the direction of the lower pressure. And the best analogy for this is a drinking straw. When you lower the pressure by sipping on a straw, you're lowering the pressure, and the liquid goes in that direction. Because the air pressure, that 14.7 pounds that's on the drink on the outside, is higher than that vacuum you made, right? So that's lowering the pressure, and the drink goes in the direction that you've lowered the pressure. Um, this is the other aspect to lift. So Bernoulli is the one that posited, yeah, what's up? Oh, sorry, OK. It's, yeah, that one? Yeah. And this uh, quote is from the PA. P-H-A-K, it's in the book. Fac. Means it's important. Um, I mean, this is really, yeah. This is really the. Uh, just the fact. The fact, just the fact. Oh, maybe. What do we think? Yeah. Yeah, OK, good. Just the facts. Exactly. If this was just the facts, then there's a lot of facts. Yeah, there are a lot. <laughs> what is a fact? <laughs> if you guys can think about it in these terms, all of the performance stuff and the density altitude stuff that we talk about later will make a lot more sense, and also how angle of attack and lift work. So just understanding basic aerodynamics and how pressure and temperature and weather participate in it is huge. So. Um, all right. Oh, man, I'm going to have extra time. I thought that might happen. Well, that's okay. If we get through the material, we get through it. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, we can just have a Q&A at the end of it. Uh, 
Let's see, or a beer. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like it. <laughs> That's right. Eight hours, I'm here because I'm here because of the throttle. Well, technically, to complete the, uh, you know, the 20 hour minimum, we have to go till nine. So, you know, so we'll have to talk about something. Yeah. Um, so, the, um, and I figured this might take a little more time. We can go back and I can actually re go through this material again if that's useful. Um, so, Bernoulli is the other side of lift, Bernoulli and the Venturi effect. So, well, Bernoulli is the one that basically says the velocity of mu moving fluid, liquid or gas, increases. The velocity increases, the pressure of that fluid decreases. So, what did we see in the last slide, right? If there's lower pressure, then the optical move in the direction of the lower pressure, right? So in normal flight, the air on the top of the wing is at a lower pressure than below the wing because that air is traveling faster over the top of the wing based on its design. Now, granted, there's some designs that don't work that way, but the types of planes that, you know, we're flying, you know, most of us will be flying and not experimental crazy, you know, space jets at uh, Area 51. This is, this is true. So what they do is they create the, the top camber of the wing is a little bit longer. So if you look at the top of the wing in this picture here, that distance is a little bit longer. So that air, in order to catch up and arrive at the back of the wing at the same time, it's going to be traveling a little bit faster over the top of the wing. And then because of that, it's actually going to pull the plane up. It's, it's drawing the plane up like a straw, like a drinking straw would. So since the object will move in the direction of the lower pressure, the plane will get sucked up, pulled to the lower pressure side of the wing. Now I say the lower pressure side of the wing because depending on the, the, in the way the plane is inverted or how you're flying, that lower pressure side could be on the bottom if you're doing something like trying to dive the plane a lot. Or I, I didn't, the, the point is, is that where that happens or where that lower pressure is gonna depend a lot on the design of the wing. So. Um, air can race around the wingtips to the low, lower pressure side, and that's something we'll talk about too later, and that induces drag. So this high pressure air and this low pressure on the top, it's going to try to catch up with it either way. Usually it's going to do it at the back of the wing, but it can go out to the top of the wing. So it'll, it'll swing around to the top of the wing. Now, this is how you remember which way vortices go. Because if you think about, oh, the high pressure errors, because it'll say, well, are vortices clockwise or counterclockwise? Does it depend on what side of the plane? But if you think about the high pressure air trying to get on top, it'll be obvious, right? Looking at the back of the plane, you'll see this. This is the wrong direction for you guys looking at me. But, <laughs> um, but you'll see this corkscrew effect happening. And these are called wingtip vortices. So imagine an aircraft that's super, super heavy, like a big 747 with a bunch of people in it and it's and it's going down the runway to take off and it's generating all of this lift that wind is starting to flow faster over the top of the wing and that pressure underneath as they start to lift up is pushing up on the bottom and it's really high here and it's really low here that wind's going to try to that air's going to try to get around to the top of the wing it's going to create these huge tornadoes off the tips of the wings becomes a very serious invisible hazard to other aircraft because you can't see them. So these vortices can linger for several minutes before they dissipate. And if you have a wind that just happens, a light crosswind that happens, where the vortice can just end up right in the middle of the runway, you won't even know it. If you get down on that, it'll flip you over just like that. So you'll hear them call heavy on aircraft. And in fact, in the ATC um, lead-in for the class, there's a, a person, this is an LAX feed that I recorded. You can hear him say heavy. The reason is, is that that heavy plane is going to be generating a lot of vortices. Not only are they on the ground, but they can be in the air. So if you're anywhere near or following the flight path or behind the flight path of a large, heavy aircraft like that, you will know it. You will know it <laughs> um, if you fly through those, those vortices. So there's techniques we can use as pilots to avoid them. We can delay landing to you know, let them clear. Or we can land at certain points in the runway where the vortices don't have an effect on us. Um, so you can land uh, beyond the touchdown point, or you can take off beyond the touchdown. I, I hope I got that right. <laughs> I have to remember that one. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about that later. So um, the, the, the vortices are, uh, 
are actually inducing drag though. And so they're one thing that causes drag. So I talked about the winglets. It's the reason I'm bringing this up, right? Those winglets create little walls on the end of the tip. And then those walls prevent that, that air from getting back up on top. And then that consequently reduces the wingtip vortices and also consequently reduces that induced drag, which can occur at any phase of flight. So that's why you see those out there. Uh huh. So when ATC tells you you're all clear, it's your judgment call of when you're going to go. Yeah, they'll say caution, off. wake turbulence okay. is what you'll hear them say. Okay. And if you hear caution, wake turbulence, it means there's a there's a plane that took off in front of you that will have probably have vortices or something. If ATCs, um, you know, some ATCs won't even sequence you behind a plane like that. They'll they'll like make you wait. You know depending on what took off, yeah, so. Um, questions in the thread, if you're asking questions, people. Not, uh, not on the side, I can't see them, they have to be in the thread. Um, yeah, that was it on that one, um, and it's 8.10. That's everything? That was all I wanted to cover today, I'm super, super early, but. Um, yeah, so 50 minutes of Q and A is probably not going to work either. Where's I got to like. Where's the right thread at? <laughs> it's. Uh, if you go to the, top, <laughs> if you go to the menu section and click threads, it's right there. Or you can it find it in the thread. discussion. What did you do? Just threads. Threads. Out. Click threads. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, which 